2020 will be remembered as the year when the aviation industry was brought down to its knees by a pandemic which caught the world by storm. COVID-19 has left airlines and airports reeling from the deep plunge in the global passenger traffic. Flights have all but disappeared from the skies. The unprecedented freefall has also forced many airlines to the brink of bankruptcies. I think this is the first time in human history that an uh, industry where people predict that the growth will be exponentially from year to year, year become drastically uh, down in just a several days only. The losses to the industry have run into billions of dollars and the outlook gets darker by the day. Airlines are probably the most exposed to this because simply all the passengers have been taken away. They can't fly. COVID-19 has shaken up the aviation industry. Will it be able to reinvent itself and recover from the impact of the pandemic? Or will the pandemic usher in its eventual collapse? Twenty twenty has been described as the worst year in the history of aviation. The rapid spread of COVID nineteen pandemic has clipped the wings of airlines around the world and ended its twenty year boom. Not only have low cost airlines been hit hard by the sudden travel meltdown, full fledged carriers have also not been spared as well. Many are now struggling to recover from the loss in passenger demand and the sharp decline in revenue. Even today, several airlines in the US and the UK have collapsed. Many others may also follow suit. This crisis now will put an immense pressure on all airlines that are neither well run, nor have the funding, and nor have the government support. So if you, if you don't have additional and new money, I don't think an airline will survive. What started out as a local outbreak in the city of Wuhan in China late last year has now morphed into a global pandemic. The virus has killed more than 500,000 people so far. The rapid spread of the virus has forced nations to close off their borders and shut down airports in a bid to stem further spread of the virus. Billions of dollars have been lost within a space of just a few months. Millions of jobs have also been put at risk as travel demand nosedives. At the beginning of the year, we made a survey of airlines and we found out that the average airline had about three months of cash cover to support um, non-operation, which means that all airlines are being spread very, very thin now. So it's unprecedented. Um, it's been described as a catastrophe for airlines. Everybody's suffering and, and it's very simple. There aren't any passengers. Most airlines generally have been grounded and so people can't fly and workers have been laid off or some have been uh, gone on unpaid uh, voluntary leave and so on. So the uh, impact of this disease has been very, very, very severe to the industry. The International Air Transport Association, or IATA, expects airlines to lose some 85 billion US dollars in 2020 because of COVID-19. The losses are the biggest in the global aviation history. Revenues will also tumble to 420 billion dollars compared to some 840 billion last year. That means half of what it gained last year will be lost due to the steep fall in passenger demand and the anticipated economic downturn. Well, the pandemic is a shock for everybody. Uh, I think nobody expected it to be this bad and this long because previous experiences with SARS uh, in 2003, MERS, you know, they didn't last for more than six months. And with COVID-19, this is the first time that we are looking at the 
uh, at an outbreak that will have an effect for more than six to eight months. So it is these kind of things that really has thrown the industry into some sort of a confusion. The 2003 SARS outbreak, which also originated in China, cost airlines in the Asia Pacific alone some six billion US dollars in lost revenue. But the industry recovered strongly as fears over the global spread of the SARS virus quickly eased in a matter of months. COVID-19, however, has taken many airlines and governments off guard by the sheer magnitude and severity of the crisis. So far, at least 15 airlines have laid off thousands of their pilots and cabin crew in a bid to preserve cash. Among them, Emirates, Qantas and Norwegian Air. Very few airlines are profitable before COVID. So now with COVID and the aftermath of COVID where uh, the recovery is going to be slow, the fewer passengers are going to fly, then I suspect airlines are going to face an incredibly tough time to make money. Irfan Setiaputra was appointed the new CEO of flag carrier Garuda Indonesia in January 2020. His key mission is to turn the once troubled national carrier into a credible and profitable company in an increasingly cutthroat aviation market. Mr. Irfan is now facing an enormous task to steer the airline through the COVID-19 pandemic. From 400 flights a day, the number of flights has dropped to less than 100 since the pandemic began. Increasing and saying that our traffic is seven, more than 70% decreased, to get back to the normal conditions, it, it for sure takes time. So the consensus is more than two years. But as CEO of a company who our life of the company depends on the traffic of the passenger, I have to make sure that the management team and all employees in Garuda and all of our stakeholders like the Minister of Tourism, like the Minister of uh, Transportation, like all the association, are hand in hand, working together to push the intention of people to travel. Because traveling is, not, uh, is, is part of our life today. Garuda has grounded 70% of its fleet following the sudden drop in travel demand. It has also laid off 180 contract pilots and hundreds of its workers. Salaries of cabin crew have been cut. Many of them have also been forced to take unpaid leave. The airline has now renegotiated aircraft leased agreements in view of the current travel slump sparked by the coronavirus. Fortunately, the airline will not be left alone to fend for itself. To keep Garuda afloat during the pandemic, the government has proposed some 608 million US dollars bailout plan for its flag carrier. We do understand that the government of Indonesia owns 60% of, uh, of this company. Yeah. And in any normal situation, uh, in any company we are facing this kind of situation, we, have, we are having intense discussions with our owner, in this case the government of Indonesia. Yeah. And for sure the government of Indonesia understands the situation. And for sure, the government of Indonesia will not let Garuda uh, work on his own uh, uh, capabilities. Just like Garuda Indonesia, flag carrier Singapore Airlines also needed a cash injection as demand for air travel dries up. The airlines reported its first annual net loss of some 212 million Singapore dollars in its 48-year history. That compares with $683 million profit in the previous financial year. But while many airlines are now facing a severe liquidity crisis, SIA has secured about $1 billion US dollars in credit facilities, in addition to the $8.8 billion Singapore dollars it recently raised from a rights issue. That will put the airline in a relatively stronger position to weather the storm. Well, Singapore Airlines has a number of advantages. It has a strong brand, it is well run, so it's quite cost effective, productivity is quite high. 
it is relatively well capitalized already, meaning yes, they had hedging losses and yes, they have eye-watering losses right now, but still they have still billions of dollars of net assets even before the injection of new capital that just happened. So in that sense, they already were one of the stronger companies going into the crisis. And now the, the rights issue they had, which gives them up to $15 billion Singapore dollars of new money, which is, again, an unbelievable amount because, uh, I mean, imagine in a good year, Singapore Airlines has $15 billion of revenue. So they're getting money, as much injection or potential injection as they had revenue last year. So in that sense, I, I don't doubt that Singapore Airlines will survive. Essentially, the airlines that are, we are seeing that are suffering now are airlines that are not financially strong. And even those airlines that are very financially uh, solid, like Singapore Airlines, we saw how they needed, you know, 15, 19 billion uh, Singapore dollars to continue for the next few years. So airlines that have access to funding, airlines that have been weak uh, before COVID arrived, those were the airlines that are, are very, very susceptible to uh, being a casualty of this, uh, of this disease. So you can say that even uh, solid carriers, uh, flag carriers, sovereign and flag and national airlines that were supported by their countries were, have also been impacted severely just because the magnitude of the disease as we have, we've never seen anything like this before. And so the, the financial impact has been very, very, uh, very, very severe, especially to uh, many carriers that are barely surviving before uh, COVID. After a hard landing, airlines all over the world are expected to face a long and painful road to recovery. The continuing curbs on air travel and border closures coupled with lingering concerns over traveling in a crowded and confined space will make it difficult for travel demand to surge, at least in the near future. After months of disarray, when will confidence return? And what will happen to those whose lives have suddenly been turned upside down when flights suddenly disappeared from the skies? Karamina's job takes her to many cities around the world, including countries in Asia, the Middle East and Europe. For the 26-year-old flight attendant, travel has become her passion and her first love. Tami joined Garuda Indonesia eight years ago, and she has not looked back ever since. That's because flying to these various cities gives her the opportunity to see new places, meet new people, and learn more about other cultures. Sadly, the rapid spread of COVID-19 has disrupted her flying routine. Garuda flights have been reduced drastically since the pandemic began, covering only a few destinations in Indonesia, including Sumatra, Java, Bali, Lombok and Papua. International flights are very few and far between. Overall, Garuda's passenger traffic has plunged 91% since April this year. It would mean not only less revenue for the national carrier, but less flying time for cabin crew like Tami as well. Frekuensi penerbangan pasti menurun. Tentunya juga uh, mendapatkan arahan dari pemerintah bahwa frekuensi flight diharuskan untuk tidak sebanyak yang biasanya. Uh, untuk dari bulan Maret, saya mendapatkan beberapa penugasan penerbangan kurang lebih uh, 5-6 kali. Perasaannya takut pasti ada. Hanya saya merasa cukup aman karena Garuda Indonesia uh, memberikan uh, banyak sekali protokol kesehatan yang harus diterapkan oleh setiap karyawannya. Untuk itu, uh, selebihnya saya juga selalu berdoa agar saya dan penumpang tetap aman ketika melakukan perjalanan. Tami, however, is grateful. In spite of all the belt-tightening measures in the wake of the pandemic, she still has a job. 
while waiting for her next assignment. Tami and many other flight attendants like her join various e-learning courses from home. This is to ensure that they remain up to date with safety measures of Garuda's aircraft during the post-pandemic period. Untuk ekonomi uh, kita serving seperti biasa hanya kita jaga itu physical distancing. Selain kita jaga jarak uh, kru dengan penumpang, kita juga terus memperhatikan apakah jarak sesama penumpang itu tetap berada sama pada saat baru boarding dan duduk sampai dengan landing lagi. Karena itu kan yang diatur oleh Garuda untuk uh, melakukan physical distancing selama di pesawat. Dan untuk di bisnis kelas, uh, awalnya kita ada penerapan perhatian yang cukup dalam bentuk kita menyamakan eye level. Eye level itu dengan cara kita jongkok. Itu akan untuk membuat penumpang lebih nyaman ngobrol dengan kita. Karena kan kalau kita ngobrolnya dengan melihat ke atas itu akan menjadi nggak nyaman. Jadi kita menyamakan eye level tapi itu tidak dilakukan lagi. Well, Tami considers herself lucky to have a job. There are numerous others who aren't so lucky. COVID-19 has forced many airlines to lay off their staff, including pilots and cabin crew. Emirates and Qantas, for example, have laid off thousands of its cabin crew and pilots in a desperate effort to keep costs down. Garuda, too, is reported to have laid off 180 of its contract pilots as well as hundreds of its workers as it continues to struggle with the slump in passenger demand. Mr. Irfan, however, insists that laying off staff has always been a remedy of last resort for the company, even as it tries to weather the crisis in the wake of the pandemic. I think what the other airlines is doing, we are thinking about it, but here in Indonesia, uh, layoff is the last choice for us. And, and we are part of, of the government, 60% of uh, 60% of the owner is the government of Republic Indonesia. Doing layoff is, uh, is not a proper way of managing government institutions. But we are thinking of lots of uh, alternatives, like what you are seeing also is that we cut the salaries, uh, and then we do also plan for or, uh, activate already uh, unpaid leave in such a way that the rights of the employee is still uh, uh, being served by the management. But yes, if it's going to be prolonged, we need to make tougher and tougher decisions from time to time. So I think uh, the, the pressure will really be on for any not so well run company that doesn't have great uh, brand equity in the market. They, I, I'm not very hopeful for them. On the other hand, for flag carriers, it really depends on how deep are the pockets of the country and how willing are they to continue support that airline? The only way for airlines to recoup their losses is when the pandemic no longer poses a real threat to passengers on their flights. Once confidence is restored, normal operations can resume again. At the moment, many of the planes are still grounded. But Chief Engineer Hadi Sunarto feels that aircraft maintenance cannot stop. It has to continue, even if the planes are not able to fly again, at least in the immediate future. Sebelum COVID terjadi, memang penerbangan cukup uh, tinggi frekuensinya. Sementara saat uh, COVID 2019 ini terjadi, itu terlalu banyak uh, resiko yang ada sehingga pesawat banyak di grounded untuk meminimize COVID terjadi di Indonesia. Dampaknya terhadap penerbangan tentunya pesawat-pesawat itu harus di grounded tidak diterbangkan, tetapi harus selalu serviceable. Mr. Hardy has been working for Garuda since 1993. At the maintenance facility, engineers make sure the entire fuselage, wings, tail, wheels and interior of all aircraft are in top condition. They will also keep a constant lookout for possible corrosion. And most importantly, they have to be very certain that the engines are in good working order. During his long career, Mr. Hardy has never seen so many airplanes grounded before. 
it's a clear indication of the sheer scale of the problems facing the aviation industry today. Itu sedihnya tentunya kami merasakan uh, dengan adanya COVID 2019 ini sangat sedih. Kenapa? Karena kami merasa bahwa terlalu banyak dampak terhadap penerbangan tentunya juga bagi MRO seperti GMF Aero Asia uh, kami sangat terdampak dengan adanya COVID-19 ini. Tidak pernah ada hal seperti ini. One of the few things that we need to take into account is that when aircraft have been grounded for a substantial period of time like what we are seeing now there are many aircraft that have been put into storage in Australia in other parts of the world when the recovery comes you can't immediately fly those aircraft as as and when you like it has to go through a certain procedure there has to be checks it has to be checks on the various parts of the aircraft on the mainframe before it can be allowed to fly safely again so safety is paramount in this industry as airlines begin to cut their workforce in desperate attempt to balance their books the number of destinations they serve will also be reduced reduced flights and destinations however could also affect international tourism still Garuda Indonesia hopes that the domestic market will recover much earlier before international travel can resume operations. The resumption of domestic flights will not only offer the carrier a much needed lifeline, it will also provide support for the already battered tourism industry. We have a lot of fantastic places in Indonesia. Uh, people who love Bali, who frequently fly from to Bali, Indonesian people, they feel part of their life was gone by not flying to Bali. Uh, we are starting having several much more interesting, like Labuan Bajo, like Danau Toba. We have so many places to go. But how soon can tourists return to their favorite holiday destinations in Indonesia and other parts of the world? Bali widely known for its stunning beaches, lush green paddy fields, and majestic Hindu temples. The island resort is also regarded as the crown jewel of Indonesia's tourism and one of the world's top tourist destinations. A record 6.3 million foreign tourists visited the island in 2019, but today, the usually bustling island is eerily quiet. Tourists who flock to this island by the thousands around this time of the year have disappeared. And the tourism-dependent economy is now collapsing under the weight of the coronavirus pandemic. Thousands of people working in the tourism industry have lost their jobs. The island resort has survived a series of tragic events in the past including the deadly terrorist attacks in the early 2000s, the outbreak of SARS and the eruptions of the sacred Mount Agong. But now it will have to come to terms with yet another calamity, which has devastated economies all around the world, including Indonesia. COVID-19 is really an extraordinary case. So it's unprecedented uh, situation. So uh, you can imagine after 58 years, it's only this time we have to temporarily close the property. It's very sad and very hard, but what can we do? Actually, when we enter uh, January, we are quite optimistic with the business because our performance is pretty good. We have about 20% increase in terms of revenue compared to January 2019. But when the Indonesian government started to announce, right after they announced the COVID 
case 01 and 02, which is, I remember, I think it's the 2nd of March, the situation just, you know, drastically changed. And uh, also afterwards, followed by uh, the airlines industry, is also chaos. And we just free fall. Free fall and the occupancy went down nearly zero. 55-year-old Aviadi has been managing the beachfront hotel since 2004. Built in 1962 by his father-in-law, Tanjung Sari Hotel is one of the oldest hotels on the island. Its guests come from all around the world. But today, hotel occupancy has dropped to zero. He's now left with no choice but to stop operations in spite of the hotel's good reputation. Many of the guests come to Tanyusari because of the staff. Between the guests and the staff, they have an emotional connection. Some of the guests actually send us email and some of them, they're willing to give us some money and especially for the staff. Like one of the, uh, the, the, the guests sent me email and they're willing to give about 10,000 US dollar and then they wanted to just give this to the staff. With no tourists and no revenue since April this year, most of the hotel's 105 staff have been asked to stay at home. Some have been working for the hotel for the last 30 years. But they now have to face the harsh reality of not having a regular job and a steady income because of the stuff is our key assets and we are not going to let them also die basically. So we, we keep on maintaining with them in terms of helping also. We give some uh, like a donation or something for, for the staff. At the moment, especially for uh, permanent employees, we keep even the contracted employees. Only daily worker, we let them go because, you know, again, talking about efficiency, we have to like really reshape the company. 58-year-old pianist Dodot Somantria Mojo used to perform at various hotels and other venues before the pandemic hit Bali. He could earn around 1,000 US dollars a month, enough for him to get by. But after the hotel closures, he can no longer entertain guests. His income has also fallen to zero. To survive, Dodot is now helping his wife to sell Mi Ayam, or chicken noodles. It's a popular Indonesian dish made up of white and yellow noodles, chicken broth, minced meat and other condiments. Kalau di areal musik ya, 100% saya hilang. Terus uh, istilahnya pendapatan ya bener-bener hilang sama sekali. Mungkin masih ada dari areal Juning piano, mungkin masih ada. Tapi tun juning piano kan saya harus datang ke rumahnya orang, masuk rumahnya orang, dan orang juga nggak 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 berani lah katakan ada orang lain yang masuk rumahnya. Jadi semuanya cancel. Di areal saya main piano, juning piano dan total. Yang paling tidak kita mempersiapkan ini lebih panjang, itu. Jadi mempersiapkan bahwa situasi ini uh, lebih panjang, akhirnya ya harus serius, harus serius di area kita jual makanan tadi. To help ease his financial burden, Dodot had to sell off a family car to free himself from the financial obligation. Food business is tough, but at least it could help him cover the family's expenses until the situation improves. Makanan itu sulit sekali di anu ya. Jadi kadang nggak bisa anu hari ini bisa 30 mangkok, 30 kotak gitu ya. Hari, hari besoknya 8, besoknya lagi 50. Ada orang apa namanya pengajian dan sebagainya butuh 40 kan gitu. Nggak tentu kali itu. Just like Dodot, Ni Wayan Swanadini has also to turn to other sources of income during these difficult times. The 48-year-old farmer supplies vegetables, fruits and spices to a number of hotels and restaurants in Bali. 
Before the outbreak began, she used to grow lettuce, basil, carrots and broccoli, among others, for a living. Now, her gardens and farms are empty because there are practically no more fresh orders for her produce. So Nadini is currently living on her savings. Once her savings run out, she will have to sell her family's livestock to make ends meet. Sebenarnya khawatir ini sangat khawatir sekali saya tentang uh, masalah pandemi ini. Karena dulu waktu Gunung Agung sama uh, bom Bali itu tamunya masih wisatawan masih bisa berkunjung ke sini. Jadinya kita masih bisa nanam berlanjut kita nanam sayurnya. Jadinya kalau dulu nanam eh, waktu ini wisatawannya normal nanamnya banyak. Kalau umpamanya di saat bom Bali sama Gunung Agung itu sedikit nanam tapi berlanjut bisa nanam kohordanya juga bisa berlanjut cuman dia menurun gininya persentasenya tidak kayak sekarang kalau sekarang terbilang di hotel itu kan belum buka 0% di hotel udah udah 0% kita sudah tidak bisa menjumplai ke hotel itu jadinya untuk kedepannya ini saya juga masih bingung yang akan saya tanam apa apakah hotelnya itu kapan akan buka kapan wisatawannya bisa berkunjung Kita juga masih bingung mau ngapain. Harapan saya sih semoga pandemi ini cepat berlalu. The future looks grim, at least in the short to medium term. The pandemic could erase more than 10 billion US dollars from the country's tourism revenue in 2020. The Indonesian government, however, is set to provide a 1.68 billion US dollars stimulus package, including airfare and hotel discounts to speed up the recovery of the travel industry. But as long as the global passenger traffic continues to fall, it will be very difficult for the tourism industry to recover and reach its pre-crisis levels. The same story plays out in many other parts of the world, including Singapore. International tourism is regarded as an important pillar of the Singapore economy, contributing to about 4% of the country's GDP. But global travel restrictions have led to a sharp fall in tourist arrivals into Singapore. And it will be a while before veteran tour guide Jean Wang could see the return of tourists to the city-state in a big way. So right now, for this uh COVID-19 is a totally different situation because so many countries are affected and even if tourists want to come to Singapore, there are no flights for them. Or, uh, you know, whether their countries allow them to leave or when they go back, do they have to go for quarantine? So all these are decisions. So really, um, it's beyond, uh, beyond us. From almost 20 million visitors it received last year, the number of arrivals tumbled to a record low of 748 in April this year, since the ban on short-term visitors was put in place. That has put tremendous pressure on many sectors which rely on tourism for their economic survival. Laura Blackhall set up Hello Tours in Singapore in 2017 four years after she established an office in Hong Kong. At the end of 2019, another branch was opened in Tokyo. But COVID-19 has brought business to a standstill for the company, which specializes in cultural tours. In early February, I personally thought that this was going to be a situation that was probably going to be limited to Asia. So, I initially thought, okay, we'll see a few months of a downturn and then we'll start to see it pick up again. But of course, as we all know, then the virus traveled to Europe and then it traveled to America. Um, our market is primarily the Western market visiting Asia. So our, our main customer base is actually uh, America, Australia, Canada and the UK. And in the middle of March, when America itself went into lockdown, that's when we saw all of our business get wiped out through cancellations, 
And it was at that point that I thought, okay, this is not going to be limited to a few months. This is a much bigger um, situation. Back in Bali, many established businesses are at a loss as to what to do next in the midst of the pandemic. Niwayan Muni opened the first restaurant in Bali's cultural centre of Ubud in 1974. Once considered a pioneer of tourism in Bali, her business has since expanded. But COVID-19 came as a rude shock. All my small business clothes, like restaurant, the shop, the spa, the small hotel is closed. So the staff, we try to help them I am thinking and thinking, what can we do to be survive, uh, survive with our staff and my big family? And we try to do like shop, online shop, many other things. We're practicing cooking in different ways so we can be alive with the staff because they have their own family too. I have no idea. That's what the big warrior, because we don't know when we going to be able to open. Aviadi Pronomo of Tanjung Sari Hotel echoes her concerns. Even if the government plans to reopen tourist destinations, the question is, when will international commercial planes start to fly again? Will passengers return in droves? It's very difficult, but the question is that for now, will there be uh, travelers coming? We don't know, because if we, if we look at the situation now, between tourism and, uh, and the airlines, they're all like, uh, they're one package basically. The tourism can start moving when uh, the airline's flying, that's basically. But now, I didn't see, you know, it's still a very uncertain situation. What can airlines do to entice passengers to fly again? Can they think of a way to make flying safe for travellers, even as countries are trying to gain control of a pandemic which has ravaged the lives of many countries the world over? The impact of COVID-19 has been financially devastating for the aviation industry. Airlines are expected to lose billions of dollars in what has been described as the worst year in the history of aviation. The question is, what will happen next? What can airlines do to stop the bleeding and ensure their continued survival? Many experts believe the answer lies in the airline's ability in restoring public confidence to make travel experience as safe as possible. From airfares to cabin layoffs, from more stringent health checks to the way food is served on board, things will look very different from now on once people can start travelling again. So what I'm going to say is that uh, we are going to do several health protocols to make sure that the people who enter the airplane is healthy. And we need to make sure that the interaction in the airplane is not going to spread the virus. And for sure, they should uh, wear masks all the time. And for sure, we would like to minimize the interactions between the cabin crew uh, with our passengers, but still make sure that the passenger will be served properly. And we're certainly recommending that all of the crew and all of the passengers should be wearing masks. Um, in terms of additional um, protection, we don't see that as necessary because this is an airborne infection. Um, it comes to you um, in, in droplets. Um, so the wearing of mask um, certainly um, seems to uh, make that risk of infection very minimal. We don't want to see too much movement around the cabin um, uh, in order to um, reduce any risk of movement of, of air from, from possibly infected people to other people. So, um, so that's, you're going to see catering that's quite different. It'll be very simple, very minimal, um, and it will be um, 
delivered to you probably as you board and then it's up to you to sort of serve yourself. There won't be the elegant um, big meals that you've seen in the past, unfortunately. Flight attendants like Tami Karamina sees the merits in putting in place all these additional measures. She feels they will help convince passengers that airlines have gone to great lengths to ensure the safety of passengers on board their flights. But there will be many things that she will miss. Tentunya, uh, saya rindu uh, perbedaan yang terjadi, gitu kan? Pasti ada perbedaan uh, dengan penumpang yang lebih sedikit. Kemudian interaksi pen dengan penumpang juga menjadi lebih berkurang untuk memenuhi physical distancing tadi. Tetapi uh, itu adalah mungkin bentuk perhatian baru yang kita berikan kepada penumpang bahwa yang sebelumnya penumpang senang untuk diperhatikan kali ini perhatian barunya adalah dengan social distancing itu uh, untuk itu penumpang akan berasa lebih nyaman berada di pesawat kita. It may be difficult for both airlines and passengers to make adjustments to the new normal, but these measures are deemed critical and necessary if the industry is to regain the confidence from passengers to begin flying again and minimize its losses. The reality is that many airlines today are struggling to stay afloat, even for big, well-established companies like Garuda Indonesia. From Garuda perspective, is we need to make sure that and telling the people and put in their perspective that traveling, flying with Garuda is safe like before. Nothing changed. I can rely on my uh, safety of not being infected with Garuda. And this is the most important thing for us to make sure this happens. Social distancing measures will also put limits on how many people who can go on board a flight. Should the middle seat be left empty in accordance with social distancing policy? Is that a realistic option for airlines to consider? If that happens, it would limit the aircraft to two-thirds of its normal capacity. That will impact on the airline's profit margins and may force them to increase ticket prices. The load factor will be decreased significantly and in the configuration of a narrow body flight, which is three seats, uh, we are going to uh, put the middle seat as an empty seat. So there will be distance between passengers in the same row. But for sure, it's going to be much more expensive for anybody to travel compared to pre-COVID. Yeah. And uh, how much more expensive, this is what we all need to do to make the calculation proper. Why I'm saying that? Because we can increase our, our price as much as we want. But if nobody fly, it's not going to be impacted positively to us. So. Uh, we are in the discussion with the regular, re, re, uh, regulatory to, to make sure that the increase of the price is still at the acceptable level. That most airlines, most of those flights will run at a loss. And keep in mind margins, even before the virus, margins per passenger were extremely thin for every airline around the world. Uh, someone once described it as every airline is a hamburger and a Coke away from making a profit on that passenger on that flight. Because per passenger, per flight, the margins are anywhere from, let's say, three, three U.S. dollars to 15 U.S. dollars, depending on the area. So those are super thin margins. Uh, and if airlines are forced to keep the middle seat vacant in order to uh, enforce some kind of social distancing, uh, they're not going to be able to make money. Will travel still be affordable to the mass market or not? And as a tour operator, that is now my primary concern and question because over the last few years, uh, one of the reasons why tourism has been booming is because the cost of the airfare has been so affordable and um, most people have been able to take multiple trips per year if they've wanted to. Um, if that is no longer the case, then businesses like myself will be hit incredibly hard uh, because we just won't have the, the customer volume coming through. 
But adjusting ticket prices is only one of the many challenges facing the aviation industry today. The real question is, what will happen to the airlines which is now burdened by a serious liquidity crunch? In the already crowded skies, mergers could be one of the options for airlines to survive the pandemic. I feel that there will be a massive consolidation in the global aviation industry. We have seen this in America for the last 15, 20 years, down to a very few very large airlines, and they were, until COVID, incredibly profitable, thanks to consolidation. So in a way, competitive intensity was reduced. Consolidation is, is inevitable in, in this time because there, are, there is an overcapacity in many parts of the world. Uh, in Southeast Asia, I think we are already seeing it in some countries. In Malaysia, for example, there's been a lot of talk uh, between Air Asia and Malaysia Airlines of collaborating or even merging together even before uh, the arrival of COVID-19. And that has taken a lot of precedence now because of the uh, disease in, in the current climate. And I suspect, you know, there, there, there will be an increased pressure for airlines in Malaysia, for example. There are three airline groups in Malaysia, including Malindo, and to see whether they can work together and consolidate the business. COVID-19 will force the aviation and tourism industries to change the way they operate. But there's no definite timeline as to when recovery will take place. If anything, short-haul domestic flights will be the first ones to recover, followed by international airlines. Indonesia's population of close to 300 million is the largest uh, economy in Southeast Asia. There's a, there's a huge market for, for flying in Indonesia. I suspect if there is a, going to be a recovery in Southeast Asia, it's going to start with Indonesia. You can't compare that with other countries because Singapore Airlines, the moment it takes off, it's already in international airspace or in some other country's airspace. So it's very difficult. And right now with this pandemic, it is a great disadvantage for Singapore because Singapore Airlines do not have a hinterland to fly into domestically like Malaysia, like Indonesia, like Thailand. So that is going to work against them. Uh, Singapore Airlines, a little bit like Emirates, they only have um, international operations. So, so they're very much dependent on seeing um, governments reopen borders. And I think that's why when you look at the measures, the financial measures that Singapore Airlines have put in place, they've um, really um, taken approach so that they can really wait and sit out the storm. And then when borders finally reopen, um, they can start operations. So they've been very prudent um, with their cash and their cash raising to be able to do that. Until and unless all barriers to international traveling are lifted, the aviation industry will continue to struggle to survive amid the current crisis. Convincing people to travel again is also not as easy as it sounds. Future travelling will require careful planning to ensure all safety concerns are fully addressed. But with so much uncertainty, only time will tell if and when aviation and tourism sectors will recover fully from the onslaught of COVID-19. So I think the next six months until the end of the year, I don't see business travel to recover much because most businesses basically have a complete stop on travel. Most businesses don't even allow all their staff back into the office, never mind travel to another office. So, I mean, I don't see business travel coming back for another six, seven months. So it may start again next year, January, if everything goes well. Basically, um, there are lots of people that want to get back flying again. So um, I've got no doubt that once um, the services are there, then there will be people to fly. I don't think it'll be on the same volume for quite some time. It will take time for the volume to recover. Um, and in the markets where we're already seeing um, domestic flights, uh, we're seeing not the same volumes as before, but nevertheless reasonable volumes. Uh, so it's going to be a, a slow process to build back to 2019 levels.